Excuse me, sir, I wonder. I wonder what you're thinking. You look as though you're dreaming. And that is why I wondered. Excuse me, sir, I wonder. Just what it is you're seeing. Your eyes, they are not blinking. And that is why I wondered. Excuse me, sir, I wonder. Just what it is you're hearing. It looks as though you're listening. And that is why I wondered. Excuse me, sir, I wonder. Just how long you've been laying inside this room just waiting. I could not help but wonder. Excuse me, sir, I wonder. I wonder why you're still. You appear as though you're ill. And that is why I wondered. Excuse me, sir, I wonder. I wonder if you're breathing, if death is what you're feeling. I really hate to wonder. Excuse me, sir, I wonder why you are not answering and why you are not caring that the morgue we're in is freezing. My world has been darkened, my memories forgotten. I'm balancing on the edge of madness. Although it's deceiving, my brain has me seeing these shadows that wander and laugh at my sadness. I see birds that are flying, but backwards they're flying, and the walls now are twisting about. The voices are calling, I feel that I'm falling. My brain now I'm starting to doubt. I can't understand just what went wrong as I lay in my padded room, because all I recall was the time that I'd spent with the old man in 402. I can hear someone knocking outside of my door, whispering to me through vents in the floor. The knocking continues again and again, and the voices get louder inside of the vents. I stand by my bedside shouting out loud, Leave me alone, stay out of my head. Leave me alone, you cannot come in. When I fluttered my eyes, the floor came alive, and I'm suddenly covered in bees. In a blink of an eye, my room is the hive. What the hell is happening to me? I yelled for the nurse and started to curse and pounded the door with my fists. I tear at my face and swat at my ears and scream at the top of my lungs in fear. And then it all stopped. The room was still and the bees that attacked me had all disappeared. It is days such as these when I'm wondering if I'll ever see daylight again. But because I believed I was covered in bees, Nurse Gloria Sue had noted my screams and told Dr. Sullivan that I was hallucinating. So they brought in the jacket, that oversized jacket, the one with the buckles and chains. As I pleaded my case, the guards held me still as they tightened the straps on my waist. I talked to the doc around seven o'clock about the incident in 402. But all that he said was to go back to bed and he'd see me tomorrow at noon. As I sit in the corner of a well-padded room in a jacket that keeps out the cold, I constantly pray that I'll get out today, but it's not all that likely, I'm told. I spend all my time just clearing my mind so tomorrow I can prove to the doc that the pills he prescribed were making me sick and maybe, just maybe, I can get back to my life, to my job, to my kids, to my wonderful wife, just the thought of that helps me sleep through the night. But while I was dreaming, I was awakened in fright by whispering voices and a light in my eyes. There were echoes of laughter as I woke from my sleep while staring at the ceiling grate. While I attempted to move to the edge of my bed, I found myself hung up in a four-point restraint. I looked to my left. I jerked to my right. No doctors were there, just the men in the white each smelling of whiskey from the previous night. They were holding the straps and pulling them tight while I yelled for the nurse, but no nurses in sight. There was no way to win as they showed off their grins while gripping my jaw and holding my chin and taking some pills and shoving them in. 
than waiting and waiting until they kicked in. I tried to keep still as they forced down the pills, which brought back the birds and the bees. When the doctor came in on the following day, he had noticed the madness in me. He shook his head and immediately said, You leave me no choice but to continue the drugs and double your dosage for seven more months. And then we will see if the birds and the bees come back to bother you then. If they do, that's a problem, and you'll have to stay longer, because we'll have to start all over again. When I spoke of the pills that were making me ill, he forced a shot into my skin. In a matter of time, I was back in the hive, just the bees and me once again. The nurse fed me pudding for breakfast and lunch. Of course, it was laced with some lunatic drugs, and dinner was served through a flexible plug that attached to my mouth so I could eat when I want. And all of this time, I've been thinking of why. Why was I left in an asylum to die? And all I could think of was my appointment last year with my family doctor who committed me here. I talked to him briefly about a sty in my eye, maybe passed along from my kids or my wife. A routine visit, I had thought at the time. But it was then when he looked at my children and wife and asked them politely to wait outside. And as soon as they did, I had asked him why. But he just closed the door with a lengthy sigh. I stood up in panic and started to cry and asked him, Doctor, am I going to die? But before he could answer, the door opened wide, and in walked three men who were dressed in white. I wanted to go, but they gripped my arms tight. I didn't know why, so I put up a fight. And during the fight with the men in the white, my doctor had stuck a shot into my thigh. And it's here where my troubles began to unfold, because this doctor of mine was extremely old. And the nurse warned me earlier that his hearing aid broke, and to speak in a loud, understandable tone. And though I was speaking as loud as I could, this doctor of mine misunderstood. When I spoke of my problem, this sty in my eye, what he thought, what he heard, was the word suicide. And the day he committed me, my doctor, he died. And my doctor was one who was very well liked by the doctors who worked in the Greenview Asylum, who believed that my doctor was undoubtedly right. So now here I sit on the floor in my room, just me and the birds and the bees. The men in the vents continue to speak. The shadows that wander keep laughing at me. And the nurses keep slipping the pills in my drinks. So what do I think? What do I think? When I think of this mistake that was made in my life, that has kept me from seeing my kids and my wife, when I think of the doctors and the men in the white, there's one thing that bothers me night after night. They still haven't treated this sty in my eye. I sit inside my minivan, a midnight crossing glowing. I watch beyond the distant trees to see the engine roaring. Oh, I felt it, oh, I felt it, passing through my body. The screams from you that night had echoed from the tracks before me. The whistles took me back through time to December 1969, the night I ran away from home and walked the tracks alone. Depression preying on my mind, but why, I can't remember. To leave my brother, mom, and dad on that night in late December. Step by step on the midnight tracks, the northern wind a-blowing. Too proud I was to turn around, so cold, yet I kept going. I heard my name in the midnight air as I felt you drawing near. The wind would mask your pleading calls as I began to run in fear. But that wouldn't last when I heard the blast, t'was the sound of a whistle blowing. That's when I turned to see you, and behind you, the engine roaring. The night the clock struck twelve and very soon after you left me, I was only nine years old, and you were only twenty. I was crying, you were dying. The moon above was brightly shining. Why did I step onto the tracks? I'm alive because you saved me.
I sit inside my minivan, the midnight railroad showing. My wife and children sleep tonight, inside the car unknowing. Why I did it, why you did it, not one day passes that I forget it. And although it happened long ago, I'm haunted by the midnight railroad.